So, hello everybody. Who oh, is quite a huge crowd here. Uh, this is actually one of the biggest audiences I had for a tech talk, so bear with me. My name is Patrick, so for those guys who don't know me, uh, I'm a JavaScript developer at Runtastic from Linz. And I'm going to talk about Flow, which is basically a type safe JavaScript or aesthetic type type checker, aesthetic type checker for JavaScript. Yes, that's what I wanted to say. So first of all, I wanted to introduce types on its own. Are they good or bad? So just don't take me literally for that. I will just measure them by kind of safetyness and by annoyance. So by annoyance, I mean how tedious is it to, to get code running and uh, to introduce new values and to work with values. So for instance, we have, this is not scientific by the way, we have Java here, <laughs> which is great because it's super safe, but it's sometimes very hard to handle the APIs because without code completion, you're kind of lost. Otherwise you cannot just create the whole object structures and all the types you need to just get one thing of the code running. You cannot just run it because the compiler won't compile it otherwise. Then you have other things like Swift, which try to be more developer friendly and more uh, with a much lighter syntax and not too complicated. So they are a little bit less annoying. And one of my personal favorites is Elmlang. So if people know it, it's a functional programming language which compiles down to JavaScript and I love the type system. If you didn't uh, hear about that, you should check it out. It's really very fun to, to program in. And where is JavaScript? I mean, I love JavaScript, don't take me wrong. Uh, when I was introduced to JavaScript with Node.js and everything, I came from a Java background, of course. I was shocked because suddenly I could do everything. I had like these objects, I can just rip out things during the runtime, I can just replace the whole prototype chain if I want to, I can just polyfill my promise library or something. It was awesome. I felt like a god, unless I hit the first undefined is not a function message, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a little bit complicated. What I wanted to have is something like this. But how do we do that? There is no viable way to do this in pure JavaScript, in vanilla JavaScript. So what we have is we have tools, we have supersets of JavaScript like TypeScript or Flow, which I want to talk about. I just named both of them. Uh, I have no prior experience with TypeScript, so if you have any questions about that, I, I would be happy to discuss about it, but I have only experience of flow. So I read a little bit of TypeScript code though, like the immutable JS library, and it looks very familiar. And we compile that to typed JavaScript kind of. So in the end, this is still JavaScript, but during the, the development, it is typed JavaScript. So this is a person I really uh, honor here, uh, which, which is very, very, very skilled for, uh, if you didn't, about him, he was the like inventor of cycle chess or the maintainer of cycle chess, and he went pro with his framework, so he knows what he's talking about. And there was this interesting tweet: all chess libraries should be authored in TypeScript. Here's why. Then he made a very interesting blog post: why types in JavaScript are awesome. Uh, I just need to fix something. Yes, now it's working. So, <laughs> yeah, it's. It doesn't matter actually, because they are very similar and the tooling is very similar. It's just a matter of, of taste and I guess uh, a little bit of type inference uh, magic which is happening in these two languages. So yeah, I'm a little bit biased here. So Flow itself is a static type checker for JavaScript. It helps you keep your sanity because you don't have to browse through like thousands of files just to know which uh, kind of value you expect for a function. It's maintained by Facebook, so you know it's good. Well. <laughs> I saw there are a lot of Angular developers here. I'm a little bit biased here because uh, right now at Runtastic we are working with React Native a lot. So the newest feature I'm working with is uh, completely written in React Native and is ported like as a module imported in one of our bigger apps. And we silently like delivered some code already. So it's working quite well and uh, we love it. It's a very nice platform. So the thing is I wanted to, to work on the tooling because a lot of things in JavaScript are not right or they don't feel right, especially if you have developers from Android and from uh, like people who code Swift from the iOS team, they are not super familiar with JavaScript. And we want to make it kind of a little bit more safe so everyone knows 
what functions are doing, and Flow is very good for that. It's a seamless superset of ECMAScript, and the nice thing about it, the extra syntax from the files can be stripped out very easily, and I will show you how. So basically, you can just write normal JavaScript and just add the, the type annotations and everything without destroying your code or like having like a superficial language. So why do we need it? For instance, we have a function, we have a super awesome library, or we have some super awesome, I don't know, uh, query parameter, uh, query function or something. We have get some data, and we have a query object, which probably contains some information about how we want to query our data from something. But we don't know, is get some data something which is uh, synchronously uh, captured, or is it something which gets retrieved from IO-based actions, like HTTP request, and it might deliver a promise, or it might deliver some kind of object or array, but we don't know. If the developer is not going there and writing a proper GS doc header or just some hint that you know that this function is returning this value, you have no idea what's going on without looking into the implementation. And this is super annoying. I don't want to like browse through all the code what we're writing, just to know what the function delivers. So maybe a few of you have already uh, experienced this. It's getting especially interesting if you're updating your code because code is not like just for one part, but after six months or so, someone else uh, goes into the code and he's like, ah, we need to return this value. And then he didn't update the GS doc header. And then you're, yeah, screwed, kind of. So this is a problem. And there is no machine readable way to do this without a human doing mistakes. So yeah, Flow does a very good job in uh, containing this problem. First of all, how do we install it? There are two ways. We can install it globally with Brew. So yeah, it's written in OCaml, which is sadly not 100% compatible with Windows. So if you're on the Windows platform, you're probably, yeah, probably al already working with TypeScript or something, but <laughs> but I've, I've checked out the GitHub issues and there were a lot of Windows developers voting for Windows compatibility. So it's not something which is only uh, evangelized by OS X or Linux users. The second part is, or the second way is to do it lo locally in your project, similar to how ESLint or Grunt or any other building framework is, is uh, or building tool is working. This is actually recommended if you have automation. So if you have a CI trying to do, trying to use Flow, you should do this, or if you're using NPM scripts. And the first one is recommended if you have Vim integration or an, another editor and you want to have the Flow command like globally installed. Otherwise, like the Vim plugin doesn't work otherwise. There might be someone who wants to fork it and uh, maybe let it search in the node modules folder first, but right now it doesn't support it. So about the flow binary, I think the, the major misconception is uh, a lot of people don't know how this thing actually works because what you do, you're not running just a command, which is run once, but if you run a command, it starts a server in the background. And another misconception is you need a flow config file, otherwise it doesn't start. That's, that's kind of uh, tricky, but they, I mean, they documented it properly, but if you want to get up and running very fast, it's very hard to do. So the first thing you have to do is you go into your project folder, you say flow in it, and it creates you a flow config which looks like this. This is the exact file, and with that it works. So this is all the magic. But flow needs it, because flow needs to know which is a flow project, and if it has the, the context, it can like namespace this whole thing internally, and you can have like simultaneous simultaneous uh, flow servers running for different projects. So this is very useful. The server itself, what it does is basically it goes through your source code inside this project folder, and it's looking for files which start with an add flow annotation. It has to be the very first line. Don't make the mistake as I do. I tried uh, to add an ESLint disable, maybe you know that, if you want to disable uh, temporarily a rule, and you put it on the first one, it doesn't grab it. So you have to put this in the first line, super important. And on the other hand, declaration files, which is basically the header files of flow. So this is going to be parsed. They split it up with their own parser, and they understand ECMAScript 6, so everything is working out of the box. And 
it stores the ASD in a cache. So whenever a file is being changed, it recognizes it, it has its own file watcher running, and it re-parses all the things, and it does it very, very fast. You should not underestimate it. OCaml is apparently really good, or the algorithm is really good to, to get the dependencies of the files and, uh, yeah, interfere the values. If you run it, you can also stop it, of course. And during uh, a running server, you can also do a flow check. If the server is not running, it already st it starts it for you. Flow check is basically just doing the check for you. And it looks through all the files and looks if it can find any mistakes. And if you get an error, they are quite, I think they are quite well formatted here. So you can see, okay, I made some mistake on line six, which is apparently an incompatible type. It wanted an object, but I gave it a string, for instance. So this is how it looks like. And you can also integrate this flow check into your NPM scripts. So what we do, for instance, we have a library which is fully typed. Whenever we try to release a version, or if you try to, to push in our Git repository, it does a flow check in the NPM scripts. And if it does not run through, like NPM test, if it doesn't run through, it doesn't commit it. So this is another like security measurements to not commit untyped code or wrong code. So for the editors, because it doesn't make any sense if it doesn't integrate with your editor, uh, the two I can recommend is, I'm personally a Vim user, so the Vim flow, it works out of the box very good. If you're using OmniFunk, like the auto-completion feature, it works out of the box. And then we have Nuclide, which is an Atom package, so if you're using Atom, which I think a lot of people do nowadays. It's actually a collection of packages. So you have a lot of tools. It's, it's built by Facebook. They use it for their own React development, and it integrates very well with the React ecosystem. So if you're a React developer, who is a React developer? Like one, two, three. Woo! Awesome, okay, cool. So yeah, we need to withstand the Angular. <laughs> so this is very good. So it's a very, very nice plugin. I use it sometimes. Yeah, and I actually wanted to explain the syntax and everything by a practical example because in my opinion, it makes much more sense if you see what's your value, right? And one of the pain points I experienced is how do you set up your project, especially if you have an already existing code base? Is it hard to integrate and, and how do you do that? So what we are using right now is we want to use ECMAScript 6, of course. So we have a transpiler, which is Babel.js. And we also want to lint our style, so we have ESLint. Sounds very familiar for everyone, I guess. So how do we integrate Flow into these two tools? The first one is Babel RC. It's super easy, actually, because Flow is maintained by Facebook, so is Babel.js, and so is React. So they made sure everything is working out together and also the Nuclide package. So what you need is just a basic uh, plugin, a Babel plugin transform flow strip types. It's one of the longest plugin names I've ever experienced. So what it does is it additionally parses your, type, uh, your typed annotations. It makes a token out of it. You have your abstract syntax tree of your code and it just throws them away. Or you can use it for something else. You can also transform it. There are very interesting features like prop types for React, which can be transformed from types to real React prop types. This is super useful because it's much easier to, to compose those types. And yeah, I know that you have to rewrite a lot of prop types if you're having different components which have a similar structure. So it's a very nice feature. And yeah, that's it. This is actually the, the configuration you need to, to get this running. So Babel now understands flow type. So cool, what can we do with that? Yeah, we have still ESLint. So one thing to mention, Babel has its own way to parse the AST. Flow has also its own way to parse the AST. So these are two different systems. You should not mistake them. So it's very important to know. And ESLint is using ESPRI. And the nice thing about ESLint is it's super modular. You can also replace the parser. So what we, what we do, and I think a lot of people do that already, is using the Babel ESLint package, and which says it uses just the, the Babel parser for the ESD generation. Another plugin, which I recommend, is ESLint plugin flow vars. 
this is basically just to, to keep the annoyance low because um, by default, ESLint will complain about unused variables if you use types in your function annotations and everything. Uh, this keeps the noise down. Just add it and it works. And the rules is also very important. Maybe some people don't agree, but I like it. The equal, equal, equal rule is set to smart. That means you can use two equal signs for null checks. You cannot use it for like real type checks with string and everything, but for null checks. This has one reason, because if you try to say, I'll just demonstrate it here. So if I go ahead and say, my val, and I say my val equals 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 null, that would compare if it's directly null. But if it's like completely undefined, I need to do this too. So then I have to do right. So this is complicated. And with the equal 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 smart, you can just do this, and you're good. It's checking for null and for undefined. Don't ask me why. It's just an it's a JavaScript thing. No, actually, no. It's 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 explainable, but I I cannot. Every time I have to Google it up and uh, I just cannot remember it all the time. I cannot memorize it. So this is that. This is the reason why I put it in there. And yeah, let's go to the practical example. Now we have set up our project and we at Artastic, we want to have like a guidance if we have someone else who doesn't know Flow because my two other colleagues don't know it yet. But I want to, to, to Flow type everything in the future. So we can find it on our GitHub repo, which is called Flow Guide. And we have our tutorial in there. So I'm going to show you this thing. So this is our tutorial. The thing is, can you see that actually? Can you see the file names? I think it's not very important though. So we start out with a very basic example. This is from a real thing I was working on. So just a little bit of context. We try to unify the way we format our code for the mobile part, like where is our React Native content stuff. Uh, we want to have the same formatter for meters, kilometers, or time, if I have like 15 minutes ago or something, that it formats in the right way. And we also reuse this, or we want to reuse this whole module for the web too. So this is one of the things. So what we wanted to do, for instance, is we have values from our backend. For instance, the, the meters I've been running and we want to convert it to different units, like kilometers and later on to miles and, and stuff like that. So what we need for that is a convert unit function. So I was writing just a very simple conversion table. I was like, okay, if you want to convert from meter to kilometer, you use this equation. So you get in the meters and you divide it by 1,000, then you have the kilometers. And the same for miles, you use this fancy formula and you get miles out of it. Then we have our convert unit, which takes a from, and a to, and a value. Then we get the transformation from the conversion table, which is basically the same structure as here, and return the value. Very easy. I think it's, I think it's very clever code, I have to say, but uh, <laughs> it's not very safe, isn't it? Because if I try to convert the unit from meter to kilometer and thousand, everything is fine. Happy paths are always working, right? So if I try to use centimeter, which is perfectly fine, if I'm a developer and I'm like, okay, if you can do meter, you can probably do centimeters too, mm -hmm. then it's like, what is it doing? I don't know. I actually didn't check. So you have to go into the code and have to find out, okay, is this, is this okay, I need to, ah, no, nah, I need to do some fancy, uh, yeah, I need to do a fancy, <laughs> yeah, like this. And then you end up like with such a huge block. And I don't want that. I, I just don't want that. This is very unclean. Um, so I have an idea. I have an idea. I go to the next example. This is also untyped, Snowflow code. Ha, huh, very clever. I just define constants. So I cannot do any mistakes. Because now I have meters with meters, kilometers with kilometers. All right. And we just make a very smart um, key replacement, a dynamic key replacement, yeah, miles and so on. And this is nice. 
So now I can just use, then I just tell my developer, okay, whatever you do, just use the constants. ESLint is checking it, right? So if I do a typo, ESLint would notice it. So this is a better-ish way to do it, but I can still pass real strings. Still very bad. So now let's go to the flow version. I, I do it like consequently. I go step by step very easily. You will see there will be mistakes in the beginning, but we're getting there. So yeah, don't worry. The first thing, we have our convert unit. We have our first parameter from, which is a string. So we know it's a string, all right. We have two, which is also a string. We have value, which is a number, and it always returns a number. Whatever it does, it always returns a number. This is super important. No null value, no exception, no anything. It's just a number. And we do the transform, which is not safe because we don't know what's in there right now. We just know there are a bunch of strings and maybe it can infer what, what's the content of that. But it doesn't really know what transform does. So it just assumes that this is going to be a number. So we can do that, it will return, but we can still do our mistakes. But at least we know when I go into the doc, if I just see the header, I see, ah, okay, you want an, like a from, which is a string, a two is a string, and the value is a number. This is a little bit of progress. So now we want to get the conversion table kind of typed. So we start out with a unit. So this is our first type declaration. So by the way, don't get confused. This code, everything which is like type code, is in a parallel universe. So it doesn't really exist. It's just existing during development. It's getting stripped out anyways. So you cannot use it like as a, you know, like a variable or something. You, you cannot just get the value from it. It's just describing your structure. So we have our unit, which is an enum. So it can be a meter, kilometer, or mile. It's a, basically what you expect for a normal enum. And then we have our conversion table type. It describes our conversion table with a from key, which is a unit, a to key, which is a unit, and the whole thing is a function. Function is very general. It doesn't say anything about parameters and everything, but we're getting there, I promise. So that's the first thing. So the conversion table is getting this. So if we try to do very funky stuff as, I want to show that in Vim actually, because I'm more familiar with, oh, oh my God. So this is the number three example. So if I go ahead, so we're here. Can you see that? Yeah. So if I go ahead and I try to add my OC, I want some liquid in there with milliliters and we just do that. Whoop, uh-oh, it doesn't work because as you can see in the first line, property OC is a string, which is not compatible with string enum. Looks a little bit confusing in the beginning. I, it took me some time to get used to the error messages, but as soon as you get the grasp of it, and if you cannot read it in the editor, you can still go ahead and just do flow check. This is very useful sometimes. Then you can really see, okay, in my conversion table, I did something wrong with uh, the enum, and this is incompatible with unit. And then I can check, aha, uh -huh, all right, let's see. What is unit? Does this work? Yes. We have auto completion, we can say unit V is a kilometer, meter, or mile. So I don't even have to, to browse to the code, I can just use the code completion and do it for me. Seems reasonable. So this doesn't mean I cannot do the mistakes anywhere, I can still compile, I can still run the code. But at least I have a last, you know, a last wall, which prevents me from doing the mistake and commit it to our, data, to our source code in our repository. All right, so. Yeah, yeah, and this is how it looks like in Atom. And yeah, it's a little bit more convenient because you can do clicky stuff. May I ask a question real quick? Yes. Um, so you have your conversion table and the keys are all units, but does it check for exhaustedness so that actually every one of those enum values is present there? Um, no, I was also thinking about that. So you can still have like an incomplete conversion table and uh, that Of course, we're getting there. Okay. Yes, <laughs> but a very good eye, very good eye. Yeah. 
you can still, I mean, what you still can do is uh, <clears throat> write a real, if you want to do that, actually, I, I didn't want to do that, but you can uh, just also say like uh, M is a unit and, and, and stuff like that. So it would be nice to have this kind of stuff, but uh, it's maybe it's possible, but I didn't use it so far. But it's a very good question. We will get to the uh, to the problem cases, to the edge cases soon. So the fn type, we, we still have this function, but we don't know what it does, and also doesn't um, flow. So we add an fn type, which is a just a function definition where we can say it looks very very similar to uh, like a anonymous function, you get a value with a specific type and you return a type. So here we go. We know that in this conversion table, these functions always return a number. And if you try to do very funky stuff here, for instance, value is a number here, and I try to pass a string, which can happen. I don't know. Yes. Then it says, something, you can, yeah, this type is incompatible with number, see also function call. So it realizes that there is a mistake. And yeah, so this is really, really useful sometimes. If I try to, try to use this, it should actually show me, yes, it actually shows me what the value is during development. Okay, so recap. Just a little bit an overview of what is possible. So we have, at, for instance, the enum and onion type. The cool thing about it, you can also have, you can also do things like this. You have a distance unit, which is, or maybe say, liquid unit, which is OC. And you can say, We have that. So you can have unions of specific types. You can uh, enhance them and then you have like a bigger type. I'm not very familiar with this one, but uh, you get a bigger type which just uh, collects all the enum types, for instance. We have function definitions. We have variadic function definitions where you can say, we have uh, a spread operator arguments, which takes an array with a generic. So you also have generics for free here. You can define what's the content of an array. And we can have object structure, which would be your case if you just define a specific structure. So it checks if any keys are missing. You can also do funky stuff like this, which is an optional. That means the value can be undefined, null, or a number. Or you can do a maybe type which means it can be null or a number. So it's very familiar to, or it looks very similar as Swift does it with the optional types. Optional types are quite mighty if you know how to use them. We have our dynamic keys, and one interesting part is the inference. Because some people would argue, okay, it's very tedious to write out the types all the time, but in many cases it makes sense that you just skip it, and Flow will do the work for you. For instance, we have a unit value. A unit value by definition is something like unit and number. And we know this function returns a unit number. So basically, if I pass in a value, and it, it is value in the value key here, it knows it has to be a number. And if I try to, to pass in something else, it will complain. So if I try, let's do this here, it's probably better. I'm just not used to the id, sorry, but it's nice for presentations though. We have our guest param type, guest param type, we pass in some string, and it should complain. I should have, I should have disabled the other, <laughs> the other problems here. So, 
in recap on line 21 and on line 45, 45 he sees, okay, it's the value and it should actually be a number. So I did something wrong with the value here. So if I pass in the number, everything is fine again. Yes. So it realizes all the changes. Export. Sometimes you want to reuse types and you can do this very easily with the same syntax as ES6. You can export type unit, export type convert and what else. And again, this is a second dimension. So if you want to import these types, you always have to say import type. And then you can just edit and, and reuse it. So it. It makes a lot of sense to reuse unit types, uh, like the types itself and export them. Then we have our maybe and optionals. And this is one of the things we wanted to enhance our convert unit. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to say, if we have a from value and a to value, and we don't have it in our conversion table, we shall return null. Then we know the conversion didn't take place. So what we do is we just make these null checks. And that's the reason why I said the smart rule is very nice here. We just make the null checks we are required to do and return our null. And otherwise we do the transform because we know the value exists. And if you don't do that, flow will tell you that there might be a null pointer. So check that first. That's the very nice thing. And when I said before, you have these very huge blocks of checks, most of the time you don't know if this is are even necessary and flow tells you exactly what you really need. Also, I mean, I'm more the functional guy. I like to, to just use function closures because they are very powerful and very easy to compose. But for the guys who want to, to add a class layer or whatever, there are a lot of people doing that. <coughs> there is also a class interface, of course, and, and flow can also pass through classes. So what you can do is you can have your member types, you can type them properly, and it will recognize it if you try to assign something weird. Yeah, it will realize it, so you're a saver with that. And you can also have the methods here. So everything is, is, is quite concise and you can just type everything like a normal function. Promises are also very interesting. For instance, we want to have this read or get values function. And then we can just return a promise which has a specific type. This is using generics. So you can put in what the values in this promise can be. And it will then check your result in the 10. So it knows, okay, this is going to be a value type, an array of value types. And when I convert it afterwards, convert unit value returns me something like this. So everything is in place. Yeah, so if you wanna check out this tutorial, you can find it, I provided the link in the presentation. And yeah, yes. One last thing, uh, the biggest problem with, with Flow itself is the, uh, the availability of third party declaration files. Because if you know TypeScript, you know you can just install, I don't know, for Express Framework, you can get the typings for this library. This is not very good in Flow, but it's very easy to write them yourself and you can just, uh, there is also a project going on, which I also a little bit contributed to, not, not too much, but a little bit. And it's basically like uh, definitely typed, the project for TypeScript, and you can get your flow definitions and you can upload your concise flow definitions in this flow type repository. You can find it on GitHub. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, when you when you debug your application, whether you are on an, a, a mobile uh, platform or in browser, um, can you just debug it uh, like looking at the Java code that is generated, or can you, does does Flow also provide source maps so that you actually see the, the Flow code? Do you know anything about that? Um, no, it transpiles you the code to as Bubble would transpile it. So if you debug, you would not see the flow type definitions. Okay, so no source, source, source maps. Does support source maps. Yeah, they support source maps, but I guess there was no use case yet to, to, to use it. 
Any other questions? The code completion was this flow, beam flow, or was this? Ah, sorry. No. The code completion was. Um, yeah, you complete me and Omnifunk and Vimflow is just using the interface for that. So if you're you installing Vimflow and you already have like type completion and, and whatever for your JavaScript, it should work out of the box. There's no configuration at all. Is the, the, the uh, editor stuff like um, kind of abstracted in, in a way so that you could, if you would like to, and you're uh, like, you've got a community like Adam, but Adam support you, but like uh, Sublime or whatever. Um, could you integrate uh, the, the full parser into the, the Sublime um, ID as well? Do you know anything? For Sublime, is there is already a flow package. So. Okay, so there are more packages? Yeah. So I didn't mention that. So the server provides you the information for code completion. So you get all the information you need, like the, the line number. If you if you can ask for types, there is even a, like a complete interface for flow itself. So if you're... So there is a huge number of, of parameters where you can manually also like find modules and you get definitions or find variables and you can find the types for that. So it's just an interface you can talk to and the editor just has to plug in. Do you know the WebStorm plugin? I'm quite sure they have that, yeah. Because it, actually the community is very small, but the quality of the, the plugins and everything is, is quite good, in my opinion. All right. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for watching this talk. Down below, you can find our channel, VNHS, where you can find a lot of different videos about front-end and back-end JavaScript. And feel free to subscribe.